chapter 5. Alan, I think you know that one. Now, I must tell you, I'm reading from the New English Standard Version, all right? For a change. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let me ask you a question. What qualifies someone for a task or to do a job? Their ability. Okay. Let me give you a story, a true story, about the testimony of a candidate who wanted to do mission work. One snowy morning at five o'clock in the morning, a missionary's candidate <coughs> rang the bell at the missionary examiner's home. He was ushered into the office, and there he sat three hours, three hours past his appointed time, waiting for his interview. At eight o'clock, a retired missionary appeared and began his question, can you spell? Rather mystified, the candidate said, yes sir. All right, spell Baker. So he said B-A-K-E-R, five. Now do you know anything about numbers, the examiner concluded? Yes sir, something. Please add two plus two. <laughs> Four, replied the candidate. That's five, said the examiner. I believe you are passed. I'll tell the board tomorrow. <laughs> At the board meeting, the examiner reported on the interview. He has all the qualifications for a fine missionary. First, I tested him on self denial, making him arrive at my home at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he left a warm bed on a snowy morning without any complaint. Second, I tested him on his promptness. He arrived on time. Third, I examined him on patience. I made him wait three hours to see me. Fourth, I tested his temper. He failed to show any anger or aggravation. And fifth, I tried his humility by asking him questions that a seven-year-old child could answer. And he showed no indignation. So you see, I believe the candidate meets with the requirement he will make a fine missionary. <laughs> Church, we need spirit-given abilities. Are we agreed on that? Yes. I know it's good to do the fleshy things in the church, but it is good if we can also do spirit-given things. But in addition to that, We've got to have spirit-produced fruit. And I think that's even more significant. It's one thing to overcome the flesh and not to do evil things. But it's quite something else to do good things. You've got quite a bit. <laughs> the legalist might be able to boast that they're not outwardly guilty of adultery or murder. And you can look at Matthew 5 for that. But can anyone see the beautiful grace of the Spirit in their life? Negative goodness is not enough in a person's life. I'm talking about a believer. There's got to be positive qualities as well. Now the message of fruit would have spoken to the Galatians because it represents attitudes that control and dictate actions rather than the actions themselves. Thus the believer's manner of life flows from a genuine inner principle, not because we are adhering to the law. Do you understand that? Yeah. It's not enough just to say, well, I'm, I'm fitting in with the religious rules. It's got to go deeper than that. Yeah. 
The spiritual behavior of walking by the Spirit, verse 16 in Galatians, has the effect of causing the believer to put away the habitual, ongoing evil deeds of the flesh. And it positively causes a believer to bear good fruit, which can only be produced by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, if you contrast that with the deeds of the flesh, you just think of the difference between the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Deeds of the flesh are done by a person's own effort, whether they're saved or unsaved. The fruit of the Spirit, on the other hand, is produced by God's Spirit, yeah. and only in the lives of those who belong to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So the first contrast between the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit is that the products of the flesh are plural, whereas the product of the Spirit is singular. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. There's only one fruit You can do up-deep things in the flesh, but there's only one fruit of the Spirit. Refer to the deeds of the flesh. A given person could only practice one or two of them. Or perhaps half a dozen if you're really in the sin. Paul mentions here <coughs> the ones that you could be involved in. But it would be practically impossible for one person to be habitually active in all the different types of sin. But the fruit of the Spirit, on the other hand, yeah. is always produced completely in every believer. No matter how faint the evidence is, it will all be there. Are you getting this on my too deep for you? I did say we call it the level. All right. If you're in John 15, if you want to turn, let me give you an illustration. A machine in a factory works and turns out the product, but it will never produce fruit. You understand that? Fruit is going to grow out of life. Yeah, amen. And in the case of the believer, it is the life of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. When you think of works, you might be thinking of effort, labor, strain, and toil. But when you think of fruit, you think of beauty, quietness, and the unfolding of life. The flesh produces dead works, evil's not. But hallelujah, the spirit produces the living. Yes. Genesis 1 verse 11 says, Fruit has in it the seed for still more fruit. John 15, let me read it to you. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he proves that it might bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. Anyone, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into fire and earth. You abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, 
and so prove to be my disciples. When the Spirit produces fruit, God gets the glory. Yeah. And the Christian is not conscious of their spirituality. But when the flesh is at work, the person is inwardly proud of themselves and their achievement, and they're pleased when others compliment themselves. The work of the Spirit is to make us more Christ-like for His glory, Amen. not for the praise of others. That's right. The Spirit's provision of fruit might be compared to a man standing on a ladder in an orchard, picking the fruit and dropping it into the basket held by a helper below. Just no matter how much fruit is picked and dropped, the helper will not receive any unless he is standing under the ladder with the basket ready. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Matthew 7, please, if you're there. No, let me see. This is a biggie. The fruit of the Spirit is the outward indicator of salvation. In other words, your behavior is an indication of your salvation. Was that plain enough for you? Yeah, yeah. A believer's sonship to God and being a citizen in the kingdom are manifested by the fruit the Spirit produces in their life. Jesus said, Matthew 7, You will recognize them by their fruits. A grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. And if you go back to Galatians 5, Paul lists nine characters of the godly fruit produced by the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Multiple characters or characteristics of but one fruit. Yeah. Now let me, I, I once, <laughs> I once took a men's Bible uh, study. Then pastor had asked me to come and talk on the Holy Spirit. And I chose this passage to talk on. It wasn't Trinity. And all these men gathered together. And after I'd spoken on it, they looked at me and they couldn't believe me. They thought they could choose which bit of this fruit they wanted to bear. <laughs> one wanted to bear love, the other one wanted to bear joy. I said, it work like that. It's all one fruit. You can't pick the bit you want. It all comes in the package. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Amen. <coughs> and by the way, they are not produced nor can they be manifested in isolation from one another. <laughs> if you want to see a pattern, it would seem that the three groups of the three virtues, there is a pattern there. The first three, love, joy, peace, are inner qualities. That reflects our Christian relationship to God. That's the first three. The next three, patience, kindness, and goodness, show themselves in the Christian attitude that we've got towards our neighbour. Outward. Yes? yes? The last three, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, reflect how we should conduct ourselves regarding our duties, opportunities and obligations as a believer. Although you can see that the first three qualities express the Godward aspect of the Christian life, the next three express the manward aspect of, man, of Christian life, and the final three qualities are selfward, 
They all apply to each of these three spheres. All of the nine manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit are commanded of believers in the New Testament. Mm. All right, not just by Galatians, but all the way through the New Testament, these qualities are commanded. Also, in every case, Jesus can be seen to be the supreme example of the Holy Spirit to be the source. Jesus Christ is our supreme example of all these virtues. If I was to spend a week talking about each aspect of the fruit, I would illustrate from the personal life of Jesus how we exhibited each of them. Do you understand that? Mm. This look at the nine fruit today is an overview, focusing on general principle. So let me start off with the first one, love. The first characteristic of spiritual fruit is love. And if you know 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Some commentators insist that this context, love, is a synonym for fruit, and therefore encompasses the other characteristics in the list. In any case, love has got to be clearly dominant. Yes. Yes. Love has got to be dominant. Yes. As Paul has just declared, the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I can pay love or I can't be love, whichever form you want, is the form of love that most reflects personal choice. Referring not simply to pleasant emotions or good feelings, but to a willing, self-giving service. True agape love is a sure mark of salvation. 1 John 3 <coughs> We know that we have passed out of death into life, because we love the brothers, whoever does not love abides in death. 1 John 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. By the same token, as John repeatedly makes clear throughout that letter, having an habitually unloving spirit towards fellow Christians is a reason for a person to question their salvation. Did you know that? You were commanded to love. Now, how can I tell you? You can't choose your neighbour. Don't think of the neighbour as the person living next door to you. And we're talking about the neighbour in life. Whoever's sitting next to you now is your neighbour. <laughs> and you are commanded, you are commanded to love them. Amen? You are commanded to love them. And it really gets me going when I say, well, I love them, but I won't like them. <laughs> That's not Christian at all. Do you understand where I'm coming from? The command is quite simple. You will love. And you won't choose who you love. You will love whoever crosses your path. And that, I can't put it any blood, look at that. That's the command. You won't pick and choose and put one in that box and one in this box and, well, I like that one. 
You are commanded to love. End of story. It gets a bit of, I told you you wouldn't love this session. I guess we told you. <laughs> All right? But I'm being honest. The command is to love one another. And if you can't love somebody, then you need to look at the basic question about your salvation. Now that's good enough, isn't it? <laughs> Let me emphasize it. For believers, love is not an option. It's a command. Walk in love, Paul declared. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma, Ephesians 5. Yet the command cannot be fulfilled apart from the Holy Spirit. And I'll say this to you, if you haven't got the Holy Spirit in fullness working within you, you are going to struggle on what I've just told you. If you haven't got the Holy Spirit's power in your life, you are going to struggle but with that command, love your neighbor. Because you will turn to the flesh. And we know what happens in the flesh. Yeah. Romans 5. The love of God has been poured out without our heart, within our hearts, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That was Paul talking to the Roman believers. Love has been poured out into us. Right, have I confused you enough? That's the first one. That's love. Let's go to joy, which is the second manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that joy is mentioned 70 times? I counted them. Seven, did you believe that? Do you believe anything? <laughs> 70 times in the New Testament, joy is mentioned. And it always signifies a feeling of happiness that is based on spiritual reality. Yeah. Joy is the deep down sense of well-being that abides in the heart of the person who knows all is well between them and God. Yeah. Yeah. You won't have that if you've got an issue with God. Your joy will be open the window straight away. To have joy, you've got to be at peace with God and everything has got to be well. And it's not, please, unlike happiness, which is a flesh thing, yeah. joy is not an experience that comes with having favourable circumstances or even a human emotion. Yeah. It's a God gift to believers. Nehemiah declared, Nehemiah chapter 8, the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you are walking and you haven't got joy, you're going to be struggling. Alright? You are going to be struggling if you haven't got joy. Joy is a part of God's own nature and with it and the spirit that he manifests in his children. What Peter? Joy is the inevitable overflow of receiving Jesus Christ as Saviour and of the believer knowing his continued presence. And there's only one way you're going to know his continued presence, by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes, Al? Um, it, it may be helpful, Keith. Um, one thing the Lord's been showing me over probably the last year, perhaps two years now, is that by speaking out the word, it helps us to grow. So, for example, by speaking out in the morning, the joy of the Lord is my strength, the joy will increase in you. Um, because the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double edged sword, and it creates power within us. Amen. So, if that's helpful. Um, okay. Thank you. But you understand what I'm saying? If you want a continuing presence of the Lord in your life, you've got to have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. 
You can study as much as you want. You can move your bed into the church and sleep in it if you want. <laughs> but that will not give you the presence. It might make the flesh happy, but it won't make the inner person happy. You have got to have the Holy Spirit working within you. John 16. <coughs> Joy not only does not come from favourable human circumstances, but it's sometimes greatest when these circumstances are being tested and the most painful. That's when you discover whether you've got the joy of the Lord or whether you're just happy with self. Yeah. Yeah. Because the moment your circumstances go wrong, your happiness goes out of the window. Yeah. But if you've got the real joy of the Lord, that no matter what's going on around you, you remain joyful. Amen? Amen. That's the real test, isn't it? Yeah. Is when you know that you are right with God. Not right with the world, that you're right with God. Shortly before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, this is what he said to his disciples. I'm in John 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Amen. And your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. God's joy is full, complete in every way. Nothing human, nothing circumstantial can add to it or detract from it. But it's not fulfilled in a believer's life except the, through the reliance and our obedience on the Lord. One of John's motives in writing this first epistle was that his joy might be made complete. Although joy is a gift of God through the Spirit, it also commanded of them. Did you know that? Now you thought that you were going to wait. I said love was a command in them. Well, joy is a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. How are you going to rejoice if you haven't got joy? Oh, the flesh might jump up and down a little bit. But you won't see real joy unless God's joy in you is complete. Because joy comes as a gift from Him. The command, obviously, is not for believers to manifest or try to imitate. The command is to gratefully accept and revel in this great blessing that they've already possessed. Romans 14. For the kingdom of God it's not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay? I'll move on to the next one. Peace. Joy speaks of the exhilaration of the heart that comes when you and I are right with God. Amen? Peace refers to the tranquility of mind and soul 
that comes from you and I being in a saving relationship with God. The verb for, the verb for, has to do with binding together. And in our modern expression would be having it all together. That everything is right. Everything has come together. So we've got peace. Amen? Everything in its place, as it ought to be. But like joy, peace has no relationship to circumstances. Philippians 4. Christians can have peace, not because they're oblivious to circumstances, simply because they've got a confidence in God. Amen. 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 Romans 8. Who causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I might upset one or two of you. Not by nature, is it? <laughs> There's absolutely no reason for a believer to be anxious or afraid. That's right. Now that will tell you what level you are walking at, alright? There is no reason for a believer to be anxious or afraid. Yeah. I go on a bit deeper in the book. You see, if you're continually anxious and afraid, there's something wrong in there. Something that needs to be mended. Something that needs to be put right. Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything. I didn't write it for you, alright? Right. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, yeah. whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Do you know something? I mean, this is the unfortunate. The modern Christian is better known today for what they don't do. Not for what they do. It's for what they don't do. They are more often here talking about doom and gloom. In this world of chaos, and that's what we got in this place, isn't it? Yes. We should be known as the people of confident peace. Our peace should be affected by what's going on around us. When every other system of stability has fallen, that steadfastness of confidence and trust in God and the message of His peace can be a very powerful fruit of the, of the Spirit, excuse me. <laughs> I'll go on to the next one, patience. Come on now. I know somebody once said to me, Lord, give me patience, but be quick. <laughs> <laughs> patience has to do with tolerance. A long suffering that endures injuries inflicted by others, the calm willingness to accept situations that are irritated or painful. Praise God for Psalm 86 tells us God is slow to anger. Yeah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. He expects you to be the same way. Yeah. 
slow to anger. Just as believers should never think lightly of the riches of God's own kindness and fair forbearance and patience, Romans 2. <coughs> they should themselves manifest those attributes that God has given to them. It's because of God's merciful patience that he's holding back the second coming. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. He's holding back the accompanying judgment on unbelievers that will come with the second coming. To Peter, not wishing for any to perish, no. but for all to come to repentance. Yeah. Believers are commanded to follow their Lord's patience. And if you read the, the Gospels, you will see how much Jesus' patience was tested. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4. That I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who was over all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Church, by the working of the Holy Spirit, God's grace has been given to each of us that we might maintain unity by putting, by putting up with one another. Mm. I won't write it down in all the nice English. I'll put it basically. We've got to put up with one another. Oh, I don't like him doing this, or I don't want him doing that. Perhaps they don't like you doing something. Yeah. We've just got to put up with one another. That's the simplest, easiest way that I can put it to you. I want the kindness. I haven't found any, but I want the kindness. <laughs> oh, sweet. No. Not at the moment, Kevin. Bless you for your offer this evening, Lord. And thank you for what you gave. I just remember it. The rain is just getting there. The word derived from the word verb meaning to take into use. That's where kindness comes. To take into use as a basic sense of an excellence and useful. If it refers to something that is well suited for its purpose, such as a worker bee, an orderly house, and healthy tasting food. When the word was applied to people, it really means this that they're worthy that they're decent, and that they're honest. When a person is all of that, they're supposed to be, and that's what we're supposed to be, when a, a human being is humane, they should be decent, reliable, gentle, and kind. This is speaking to me and it ain't doing me any good, all right? <laughs> I told you God keeps opening the door and showing me things. You're not on your own, all right? I wrote this, but I'm still. <laughs> all of this is included with what our Bible calls kindness. It's not just having a sweet disposition. I've got proof. <laughs> it's all about serving, having that productive trait. I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
Because some people, the state kindness is just a good personal quality that we will help people. It goes way beyond that. <coughs> Possessing godly kindness makes the difference between useful or case aside. Let me read you two Timothy. Now in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay. Yeah. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the background of the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Yeah. Faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently. Endure evil. Correct his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Come on. Church, kindness is not remaining silent in the face of error. But neither is it responding in hostility. All that does is promotes a quarrel. How many of you know that? Yeah. Yeah. You can approach somebody, and if you approach them in the wrong way, you end up having a major argument. It all depends on how you approach. Mm Hi, -hmm. right, Jeanette. Good to see you. You're not sneaking in, all right? <laughs> the ability. To possess and deploy the fruit of kindness, even in the face of hostility, makes the difference between one who can be used of God, or you can be one who is cast aside because their hostility interferes with the presentation of truth. And we've all met them, haven't we? I want number six. Goodness. Stop me if you want to ask. I won't have the answer, but you can stop me. All right. <laughs> Goodness has to do with moral and spiritual excellence that is known, did, you, did I write this? Is known by its sweetness and active kindness. It means about doing good to others. Barclay, like a quote Barclay, goes so far as to say that the primary idea of goodness is generosity, especially the kind of generosity which gives a man what he could never do. Yeah. How was that? Jesus. How many of you know that you can give something to someone right. that they could never do? All you've got to do is smile. <coughs> Just smile at them. The earlier commentators, however, found a more distinctive difference between kindness and goodness. A man might display his zeal for goodness and truth <coughs> by rebuking, correcting, and chastising. And they they quoted when Christ drove the buyers and the sellers from the temple, or when he pronounced woe upon the scribes and the Pharisees. <coughs> this was the domain of goodness. Kindness, on the other hand, was what Jesus showed to the sinful woman who kept and wept at his feet. If the words are taken with the distinction maintained by earlier commentators, kindness and goodness 
balance each other very nicely. Kindness alone might be too ready to forgive failure. Did you know that? If you just had kindness, you might be too quick to forgive failure. Goodness alone, by the way, might be too ready to condemn. So we need a mixture. Now you might have begun to understand why it's one fruit. They're all joined together and not separated. It's no good you having goodness if you have more kindness. Do you understand that? Yes. They balance each other out. I mean, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. To this end, we also pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve of good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The exercise of goodness is not that we may be regarded as good people, but that the grace of God may be seen as evidence in our life. It's not so much about you being a good person, it's that God's grace is seen. Why? Well, the praise hasn't got to go to you. If you just be a good person, Everybody likes you and they're all complimenting you. But if it's by grace, then God gets the praise. Amen. And God gets the glory. Amen. 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 Now we reflect on these last three fruits. The Christian who is patient, long suffering, will not want to avenge themselves or even wish difficulties on those who oppose them. They're going to be kind and gentle, even with the most offensive person, and will sow goodness where others sow evil. Human nature will never, ever be able to do that on its own. Did you get that? Only the Holy Spirit can bring about what we're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. Faithfulness is the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit that pertains to loyalty and trustworthiness. Jeremiah declared that the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Have I said that somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> like a job. Work Corinthians 4. This is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is a requirement of stewards that they be found trustworthy. That one life would so embody this fruit, it brings an assurance of our destiny. I did Revelation only once. Revelation 2. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Gentleness. I'll be honest. A better translation of gentleness is meekness. If that makes sense to you. Yeah. Okay. Meekness. A better translation of gentleness is meekness. Okay. It's the humble a gentle attitude that is patiently submissive, whatever the offence, while being free of any desire to have revenge. That's a hard one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen some of you sliding down in your seats there. 
1 Timothy 6. Of the nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, this one and the one following do not apply to God. The Old Testament never referred to God as being meek. And the New Testament, only the Son is spoken of as being meek. And that only in his incarnation. We, like the Lord, as I will read you from 1 Timothy 6, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gentleness has got a godly regard for others. All right? It's like you wearing a garment. It's like a garment. It means you're willing to pass it over on them. Gentleness means forgiving others in the same way as the Lord has forgiven us. Yeah. Not because they've changed. Not because they're doing this. Not because they're doing that. Not because they gave me this or they gave me that. God forgave you when you were in your sins. Mm -hmm. And that's how we have God forgiven. That's Colossians 3, by the way. When the previous fruit is evident in our lives, then we begin to have happiness. <coughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? When your love is right, when your joy is right, when your patience is right, and all the others are right, then we will be gentle in one another. But remember what I said, you can't pick the bit of fruit that you want. It comes in a package. It's just one. And we've got to allow all of it to develop within us. Oh, this is the hard one. Self-control. <laughs> Do Peter work? For those of you, it means that you must restrain your passion and your appetite. Adorable food. Whatever your appetite is. What you're watching on the telly. What you're reading. Watch that appetite. As with meekness, this grace doesn't apply to God because he doesn't need to restrain himself. But perfect holiness, and don't tell me there's not one of us who got there, all right? You can come up to me afterwards and tell me I'm perfect. And I'm, just, <laughs> I'm sorry, I would just laugh at you. There was only one who was only one who was perfect, and his name's Jesus. But if you got perfect holiness, it means you got perfect control. Oh. Is there one of us who dare to say that we've got perfect control? Can you come spend half an hour with me? I'll see you lose your perfect <laughs> develop these qualities, however, it prevents many from being effective witnesses for the kingdom. You see, if you haven't got all this go, if you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to work with you, you understand what I'm saying? If you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to, to bring these fruit into fullness, 
and you haven't got the gentleness, you're going to be a very difficult witness for Jesus. Because yeah. yeah. the wrong side of you will be showing up. And you lose your cool. You lose your passion. You begin to show the wrong things. And it doesn't take much to turn a non believer off. Yeah, that's right. All right? It can, months of work can be ruined in a moment simply because we let our mouth run away. So, what I'm trying to say to you gentleness and self control, that's so important. The biggie biggies. That we are showing this in our lives, that we're tolerant of others, that we put up with others. I know some of you look with really strange eyes when I said that, but that's the command. And you can't choose who it is. You've got to put up with others. Those who live in a righteous manner live in such a way that they have no need of any law or admonishment or constraint but willingly do what the law requires. 1 Timothy 1. The law exists for restraint but there is nothing to restrain in these qualities. Paul here is using a figure of speech and in the, in the, the writer using a major statement to make an important point. Not only is there no law against the good Christian virtue, Paul enumerates, but these virtues are highly desirable. They are what God wants in your life. And such attitudes and actions in the Christian will conform completely to God's will. Yes. The believer who walks in the Spirit and manifests fruit doesn't need a system of law. And the word I stop here, because the Spirit just went to you. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I don't need laws. If you've got this fruit going, then you won't need a law to come at you. You'll be living in such a manner, you won't need a law. You understand what I meant? I'm coming to the end now, but you understand what I'm saying? If we get to this place that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to bring the fullness of this fruit into our lives, we don't need laws. Whatever the Lord's had, because we will be walking in such a manner that we will obey him. Yeah. I think I might now not come to the end. Yes, I am. And that's the end of the second session. No. For those who are interested, I'm spending the afternoon talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Okay? So we're going up another level. Okay. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Right. Now if some of you are disappearing to have lunch, can you be back here for quarter to two? <laughs>